I found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley in Kim alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. Father, just thank you for this evening that we can gather together. Thank you for this wonderful weather you give us today. And dear Lord, as uh, we gather these tithes and offerings to help take care of our church and the needs of it. And just, uh, just want to thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, you have count your blessings. Can't count that high. <laughs> oh. Yes, but sometimes, sometimes I can forget to count it all. And shame on me because the Lord has blessed in so many ways. Okay, before we have uh, a special, let's go to 27. And we're just going to do... We're just going to do the first two verses of 27. Okay, number 27, 1 and 2. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love.
taught the wind to sing the source of the rhythm my heart keeps beating they say you can give the blind their sight you can bring the dead to life you can be the hope my soul's been seeking I wanna tell you now that I believe it I wanna tell you now that I believe it I do but you can make me new oh, oh I'm an empty page I'm an open book Story. 
to Vineyard, Mr. Munson. We really appreciate your ministry, and it's exciting to uh, anticipate that God is going to continue to bless Calvary in the realm of uh, music and and uh, how, how greatly we have been and continue to be blessed, and uh, to hear our young people sing like that, and uh, for us to view them uh, with a heart of uh, thanksgiving and love towards them as we so often cite, we love our young people so very much. And what an appropriate, prayerful plea that we would allow God to write this, his story on our hearts. In fact, I, I think that's a, a perfect preludial prayer uh, to our study, and so let's pray it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ministry. Thank you for all of your people and their various engagements and such. Thank you for our young people. Thank you for the message that they have given to us tonight. Thank you, Lord. It really is a, a most appropriate prayer as we get ready to open up the pages of your book that we would allow you to write your story on our hearts, which means many, many things, including that our hearts tonight are once again cultivated and ready to receive your truth. We want to know your will, and we want to do it. Uh, we understand that these things are beyond us. We understand and fully accept and wouldn't want it any other way that we are completely and totally dependent upon you, but we recognize and embrace the challenge that uh, inherent in every command is, is the, the capacity to do. And so as we plug that into our study in James and are reminded broadly of just how practical his teachings are to us, we Lord, uh, recognize again how appropriate this prayer is. So, so write your truth on the fleshly tablets of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in James continues tonight. Uh, we are hovering over chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, where James discourses the all-important topic of wisdom in verse 3. I remind you that he, James the writer, gives us a definition for wisdom Namely, a wise man is someone who is knowing the word of God, the Bible, and with the Holy Spirit of God's help, properly applying its truth to his life, so that in turn he's in a position to provide godly and wise counsel in the lives of others. It's part of our heart cry indeed that God would make us wise. Then James in verses 14 through 18 contrasts the two kinds of wisdom. In verses 14 through 16, worldly wisdom, wisdom from below. And in verses 17 and 18, can't wait to get to that, heavenly wisdom, obviously wisdom from above. In verses 14 through 16, we are in the process of working our way through this text and listening to to James' discourse and describe worldly wisdom. In actuality, what James is doing is he's giving us in these verses a list of descriptions of worldly wisdom, or maybe better stated, he gives us a list of the products of worldly wisdom, what worldly wisdom produces in the lives of those who embrace it. By the way, we're very interested in that for many reasons, including the fact that even though we are God's people, even though we belong to God, even though we have his book, even though we have his spirit who has permanently tabernacled in, my, in our hearts and lives, the fact of the matter is at any given time, you and I can be governed by worldly wisdom. And inherent in all of this are so many good reminders, including you know, and thinking of uh, Trevor and Alyssa and other of our young people, including this uh, prominent biblical principle, and sadly we often pass it on to our young people and cease to heed it ourselves how important it is that we surround ourselves with good and godly counselors. I'm often reminded of uh, the wise man's uh, principle that we really become like those whom we hang around with. We preach that with power and passion to our young people and yet sometimes set aside practically the principle when it pertains to adult Christian living. Uh, and, and, and so again, uh, so many different reminders, uh, so much so that I need to be careful that we don't get sidetracked. 
So James is constructing a list, and you need only the very first thing on the list. We already have three. You don't go very far on the list before you're recognizing that, hey, this is not a pretty picture. We have three things on our list so far. Product number one, when you and I, or when anyone embraces worldly wisdom, it first of all produces in our hearts and through our lives envy. Two, strife. And three, lies. And that really sets the tone for the list, and James isn't done. That's part of the reason why we are here and rehearsing these things, and uh, uh, the, the, the list is uh, obviously going to continue. I noted with you that you don't have to go very far before you realize that this is not a very admirable list. You don't go far in the list without asking, and we began to do this last week, why in the world would anybody in their right mind embrace worldly wisdom if this is what it, if this is what it produces, if this is what it results in? But remember that our spiritual arch enemy is behind this, which means that deception is the name of the game. He promises that which he cannot deliver but he freely makes the promise. He promises life, but he delivers death. He promises satisfaction, but delivers emptiness. What's increasingly interesting to me as I run just a little bit ahead of you in regard to the study is that the, the, we are actually, and this may not make a lot of sense to you, and again, that's because I haven't prepped you well for it, but we are actually constructing a list of the works of the flesh. But how is Satan going to sell that? You can imagine him, the salesman, saying, hey, w- would, you, would you like a life that is full of envy and full of strife and full of lies? And, of course, he knows better than that. So when the small g God of the world and when the world of the small g God offers its wisdom and makes its sales pitch, it's going to be offering to you the exact opposite of what it actually delivers. We have every reason, not only to be concerned and to be on guard, but we have every reason to absolutely reject worldly wisdom and with passion to faithfully and consistently and constantly be pursuing heavenly wisdom. I'll give you a couple of examples. The wisdom of this world says go for all the gusto that you can. Some of you are old enough, uh, at least Pastor Tom's age, to, to know that that was a very effective beer commercial at one time. Go for all the gusto you can. You only go around once in your life, and so go for all the gusto that you can. You really don't want to get me sidetracked in regard to beer commercials. I, I, I don't know that there's too many things that I detest on this earth as much as those And the only reason I'm even familiar with them is because every other commercial when you're watching a ball game, the Tigers, the Lions, the Red Wings, it matters not, every other commercial is is promoting uh, the significant use of alcoholic beverage. And, and, And what it promises, well, for guys, it promises that you will have trouble sorting through all of the beautiful women. And what it promises for everybody, both male and female, is the very moment that you take a drink, you will be on a beautiful sunsetting beach, flipping off your sandals. And who in the world wouldn't want to go there? But what does the thing deliver? What does it actually give? hate those things. The wisdom of this world says go for all the gusto you, you can and then it effectively 
hides the fact that a life lived in self-consumption actually will cost somebody their soul. The wisdom of this world says pursue riches, pursue fame, pursue power, while effectively hiding the fact that such pursuit results in a gravely empty life. I am so appreciative to God for my family, and each one is a wonderful resource to me. Uh, you, you know, he won't like me citing this, but um, I can't tell you how often uh, our, our youngest son, Luke, ministers to me and, and how our conversation lends itself to the ministry that God has given to me. In fact, uh, you know, often I'm making observations that, that are forthcoming from conversations that he and I ha have had. I I'm thankful for that. We have uh, someone who graciously supplies us with a subscription to World Magazine. Uh, some of you probably get it. It's uh, World Magazine. It covers the world, covers the world news, but it does so from a Christian perspective. And uh, fortunately for me, because I don't always have the time to read through the thing, especially cover to cover, Luke usually is the one who gets the publication and uh, works his way through it, and then that warrants our having, uh, you know, some significant discussion about the contents of the magazine, and it's valuable to me, and it actually saves me in some ways, but continues to inform me as well. And he, uh, he, he shared something with me that I'm going to share with you in just a moment, but first a broad observation, again, in light of this scenario that I've created. I can't tell you how many times in reading the World Magazine, but it's available in other, um, in, in other, other uh, uh, publications and, and uh, sources of news. I can't tell you how many times we have noted that here once again is a man, a woman of the world who has had everything that this world has to offer and has subsequently committed suicide. You know, you and I, because in some measure we lack the money that we desire to have, we, we take a look at things like that and we often say, if I only had this, if I only had that, then I would really be happy, I'd really be satisfied, and yet, time after time, I don't know that there's a day that goes by where someone who is prominent doesn't testify either with life or with death that when you have those things, those things do not bring satisfaction to life. And so I couldn't help but think about that as, uh, as I listened to James and as we embrace his in instruction, this worldly wisdom would say, go f for the gust of worldly wisdom would say, pursue, make it a life pursuit. The idea of... Uh, uh, of uh, riches and fame and power, and then it effectively hides the fact that the result of those things is a gravely empty life. And of course, we have a biblical message from Solomon and Ecclesiastes in regard to that. And then one other very quick illustration. Worldly wisdom says, take care of number one, and guess who that is? It's me. It's you, you know, and I, I don't want to disparage, uh, you know, any fast food restaurant. Thank you, God, for fast food restaurants, but, you know, we've really bought into the idea that we deserve a break today, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, and this is embracing the philosophy of the world, and you know that. Take care of number one. Guess who that is? You. And so we hear, even within Christian circles, the idea that we need to stand for our own personal rights. We need to stand on our own personal ground. This idea that we are entitled. You're wondering why our country has the uh, atmosphere that it has. But we have collectively bought into this idea that we are an entitled people. That we are deserving of things, so many more things than what we have that it really is all about us, all about me, and a zillion other expressions <coughs> of the selfism that marks this world 
that we live in, and all the while effectively hiding the fact that the only thing that will count when everything is said and done is not what you and I have done for ourselves, but what you and I have done for our Savior. And by the way, this has absolutely crept into the church. And that's why if we're not careful, our worship will become more about us than it is about him. You see, you and I, and I'm not finger pointing, I'm reflecting on my own heart, you and I, we, we ask the wrong questions when it comes to worship. And when everything is done, is said and done, we're after that which is pleasing not to him but to us. So you'll find nothing in that that even begins to jive with what the true biblical definition of worship is. Where, where we're prostrate before the great God of the Bible. You may have heard this. I, I have an example, again, from the World magazine, and so that's why we, we said what we said earlier, because I wanted to lead you here. And uh, because of what transpires, you know, even during our Sunday school hour, have I told you lately that I love our Sunday school hour? I trust that you're a part of it, and, and if not, you'll be greatly blessed by making that a part of your life. And I know that uh, our Sunday school classes do a good job in, in, in pursuing some of these things, but... I, I'm back to what Luke read to me out of the World Magazine of late. H have you heard um, uh, the comments of uh, Victoria Osteen lately? Joel Osteen is uh, the senior pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. You sports fans will, will appreciate this. They bought the former home of the Houston Rockets. And after a $105 million restoration, Lakewood Church happens. 43,000 attending. Let's see, let's take a count. Joel has married his co-pastor, Victoria. She stood in front of these thousands of attendees, and this is what she said. By the way, because you're interested now, right? By the way, Joel Stein knows down deep that he is a part of the prosperity gospel movement, but swears uh, figuratively up one side and down the other that he's not. And as he does such swearing, he leaves the interview and goes home to a $10.5 million mansion. Now listen, how in the world could a Christian justify living in a $10.5 million mansion? Listen, I don't want you going away from here to tonight saying, ah, Pastor Tom's against me living in a nice house. I'm not talking about you living in a nice house. I'm not talking about you legitimately enjoying the physical blessings that God has brought your way. But I will challenge you that the day that you move into a $10.5 million mansion, you will have Pastor Tom standing even publicly and challenging you in regard to the legitimacy of that in your service for the Lord Jesus Christ.
Here's what she said. It's a quote. This is Victoria. She's standing right next to, if you saw the YouTube presentation, she's standing right next to Joel, and Joel's smiling like he just ate a bunch of bumblebees. I'm not sure where that came from. That might have came. That might have come from my grandpa. Here it is. I, I just want to encourage every one of us to realize that when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's a way that you could look at it. We are actually doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we are happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for yourself. Do good for yourself because God wants you to be happy when you come to church, when you worship him. You're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what God, that's what makes God happy. Amen? And 43,000 attendants stand and rejoice. Pretty sad. You expect it of the world. Heartbreaking. That it comes from the church. By the way, I don't know how I'm ever going to live my, with myself because my public statements tonight have made it so that when $10.5 million mansion comes my way, I'm going to have to say no. <laughs> God help us. Listen to Christ's words in Luke 9, 23. I think they ought to be hidden in our heart. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I don't understand it. It is a false teaching how that we can follow the one who didn't have a place to lay his head with a 105 million dollar mansion now listen you don't have to be living in squalor and there's nothing wrong with your good home if you're using it for the honor and glory of god and if the world even can look at such and say there is a man a woman a young person who is not possessed by their possessions but they are possessed by someone or something else the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep all of that in mind, all of that in mind. As we follow James, and as James continues to construct a list for us of the products of worldly wisdom. At the end of verse 15, James describes worldly wis wisdom with a trilogy of terms. You see it there, James 3 and verse 15. This wisdom descends not from above, but is, here it is, earthly, sensual, devilish. Again, I'm not going to be the same from here on in. You know, initially I was saying, why in the world would anybody embrace these things. I mean, even the worldling, if he knew it up front that this is what worldly wisdom produces, why would, why would he embrace that? But what we're going to see, along with what we've already said, that the, that the master deceiver, the father of lies, is behind this thing, and that he promises something that which he doesn't and cannot deliver, the fact of the matter is, is that all of these things end up being appealing to the flesh. And sadly, even God's people sometimes temporarily arrive at the place where they are governed by their lusts rather than their Lord. And that's what sells. And Satan 
is masterful. So here's some additions to our list. A list of descriptions, or better, a list of, of products of worldly wisdom when embraced. Earthly, sensual, devilish. Interesting words for us to think through. I'd like to do two things with them. One, I'd like to step back and make a broad observation, and, and then I'd like to step in and, and, and say a, a, a quick word about each of these words. Here's the broad observation. The Christian has three enemies. You and I, the sons and daughters of God, part of the family of God, you, you and I, we have three enemies. One, the world within which we live. Two, the old man who lives in us. Yet. Ah, oh, can't wait till God completes his promise of glorification. And three, Satan, who, as you know, represents a vast, multifold and multifaceted spiritual enemy. This is interesting. These three enemies, the world within which you and I live, the old man who lives within us, and Satan and his horde, these three enemies are, are represented here by these three things. I thought you'd be interested in that. The world, enemy number one. Our number one enemy, I, I don't know that I want to rake them like that, but enemy number one, the world. It's represented by the word earthly. Our second enemy, the old man and his lusts, who still, the old man still resides in us. He's represented by the word sensual. And our third enemy, Satan and his horde, is represented by the word devilish. I remind you of Ephesians 6.12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. You got your hands full, folks. Quick word about each of these words. Thank you, God. Oh, God, you're so good. James writes, worldly wisdom is earthly. That's interesting to me. You're saying, Pastor Tom, do we have a good translation here? And of course the answer always is yes, but Pastor Tom, do we have a good translation? Are you sure that James isn't speaking of the world rather than the earth? And the answer is he's actually speaking about the earth. So much so that the Greek word means literally upon soil. What's interesting to me about that is that you and I know that there's nothing inherently sinful about soil. This terrestrial ball, although it's been greatly, greatly impacted by the effects of sin, so much so that creation even groans, right? In Paul's writings to the Christians in, Rome, in, in Romans, at, at Rome, the, the, this terrestrial ball, although greatly affected by sin, actually there's nothing inherently sinful about this terrestrial ball. In fact, you and I know that the Lord Jesus Christ called the ball into existence. So, so what does James mean by this particular word? And, and I, th I think, and you guys are probably better than I in regard to this, but I, I think we can know. And I believe James' point here is that he, he's He's reminding us that worldly wisdom invests exclusively in this earth. And the problem with this is that this earth is going to pass away. The worldling and sometimes even God's people are blind to the fact that this world is going to pass away. James' point Worldly wisdom invests exclusively in perishable things. So how is, gonna Satan, how, how is Satan going to sell that? Well, again, promise that which he cannot deliver. Say it's life, in reality it's death. 
And then James says worldly wisdom is sensual. It means that it appeals to one's lusts. That's why people continue to embrace what Eve initially embraced. You shall be as gods, Satan says. And we buy that. Worldly wisdom feeds the flesh, not the spirit. And that, again, by the way, mechanically is the reason why Satan is so effective. Because that does draw us to consume things on our lusts. By the way, James will revisit that terminology in talking to us about the topic of prayer. And then James says worldly wisdom is devilish, literally demonic. This is interesting. It it, it reminds us that we don't, a couple of things, it reminds us that we don't deal only with and exclusively with Satan. I mean, he is always the source of the thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not in a position, especially in light of what, you know, like what Peter writes in his first epistle where he says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. The devil is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But I, I think the practical reality is that it isn't always Satan that we are dealing with. It isn't always Satan who's tempting us. It, he, he's got a lot of helpers, if you know what I mean. And and James is prompting us to think of that. And and I I guess what I want to say, and I can do it succinctly, is that demons actually propagate and promote worldly wisdom. They are the salesmen. And I don't want to lose you, but I have to say it then in light of my utter hatred for beer commercials, that those things have actually been written by demons. And now a final word. Thank you, Lord, I have two minutes. James completes his list of worldly wisdom's products with a word, confusion, and a phrase, every evil work. When you and I embrace worldly wisdom, one of the products of that is confusion. And you and I are in a position to especially appreciate that in light of what we know to be true of heavenly wisdom. Because heavenly wisdom paves the way for us to see things clearly. But when you and I embrace worldly wisdom, all of a sudden things get very, very confusing. God's got better things in store for God's people. And then he closes off the list with this phrase, every evil work. Something that you miss that's in the original. And I think it's actually a trans, uh, one of our English words is actually a transliteration of the Greek word. The Greek word is phallos. We get our English word foul from it. Which includes, interestingly, so even the stench of the thing. James testifies that when you and I, and certainly when the worldling embraces um, this world's wisdom, it in turn is the breeding ground for every kind of evil work. You and I as God's people have every reason to abhor the wisdom that this world offers and with passion to be consistently and faithfully and constantly embracing the wisdom from on high. We finally get to it, the Lord willing. We get, to, we, we get to Paul's list of the products of heavenly wisdom when you embrace it. How exciting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We're so privileged to be in this place. We are so privileged to, to know you. We're so privileged to have the inscripturated word of God. So privileged to have James' epistle. 
And in light of this morning's message, I would pause to thank you for all of those letter carriers and mailmen and mailwomen and preservers and securers of this epistle so that we could actually have it in your book, so that we could actually open it up and study together these inspired words. And oh, how James continues to be so very practical with us. And oh, how we have seen and heard enough (coughs) to abhor worldly wisdom and with passion to embrace true wisdom that only comes from on high. Continue to write these things on the fleshly tablets of our hearts, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Had it been in the hymnal, we may have sung, I've got a mansion, but but it's not on earth. (laughs) I can tell you that one was much more costly than $5 million. Absolutely. Absolutely. But may it be our hearts, thoughts, and cries that the truth of 46 and this singing uh, verse 4. Of 46, standing and singing, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. May it be true of us. Verse 4. Every knee his can supply. Every good in him I see. On his strength divine rely. He is all in all to me. Blessed Lord, I see. 